to kick things off, um, we're here talking about your fabulous book um, on disinformation, how to fight for truth and protect democracy. Uh, so when you when you kick off the book, you you do it pretty straight. You know, we're living in a quote world of reality denial where truth is subordinate to ideology, feelings have a bit more weight than evidence, and democracy hangs in the balance. Um, so let's we set the stage a little bit. Uh, what epistemological state are we in? Uh, why did you feel compelled to write a book that quotes Holocaust historians and U.S. Army threat casters, and that liberally dis discusses the risk of electoral dictatorships, civil war, coups, and the quote end of American democracy? Lee, over to you. Tiffany, let me say how much I admire your work too, and thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. I'm I'm always reading your uh, work in the in the New York Times, and uh, you are uh, tip of the spear in the fight against this disinformation. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I tried to pack a lot into this book, and I knew that I wanted to make it a very short book because I didn't want it to be a book that someone reads and then puts on the shelf and doesn't think of again. I wanted to make it something small that they could carry in their pocket, something that they could also uh, lend to a friend, uh, leave it on the bus and somebody else finds it, you know, hand it out. Uh, it's it's a small, you know, compact kind of a, a training manual for how to deal with disinformation. I was inspired to write this book by Tim Snyder uh, on tyranny. And he's one of the Holocaust historians that I that I quote. And the reason I wrote the book is because I feel that we're in urgent times. Uh, at the dawn of the Russian Revolution, uh, Vladimir Lenin said that there were uh, decades in which nothing happened, and then weeks in which decades happened. And I feel like we're in the latter right now. A lot is happening way too fast. And one of the, I don't know if you've noticed this in your own reporting, it's always seemed to me that one of the goals of disinformation is not just to make people believe a falsehood, but to demoralize them, to make them feel that it's impossible to even know the truth, which makes them cynical, makes them give up, makes them feel helpless, like they can't fight back. And so I wanted to write a book that told people, you can fight back, you can understand what's going on, you can understand the roots of it, but there are also things that you can do to push back that was important for me. It's, I'm trained as a philosopher, as a scholar, but I'm now a public philosopher, and I want to be involved in advocacy. And if a philosopher can't advocate for truth, I don't know who can. Right, right. Well said. And we'll definitely get to this idea of demoralizing people um, later on today. But but tell me a little bit about the, the ecosystem that enables dangerous disinformation. So the social media companies that you describe as talking up the number of problematic accounts that they shut down while refusing to expose the algorithms, uh, the media outlets that employ performative objectivity while sensationalizing coverage. And you know, as you cite one <laughs> journalism professor explaining, quoting one person saying it's raining and another saying it's dry without just looking out the window to confirm which yeah. is true. So talk to me a little bit about that ecosystem and how yeah. that plays into the spread of this information. Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, the ecosystem, there are kind of a couple of different things going on. One is that we live in times when people engage in motivated reasoning. Now, maybe that has always been true because there's always been cognitive bias. It's just you know part of the human condition. But one of the accelerants to that now is that people can find one another. Um, if somebody has a crackpot opinion or believes something wrong, or they, they want to spread an idea and see who else will go for it, they can find their people on the internet. And so, you know, sometimes people, you know, ask me, well, you know, how is this different than it was 10 years ago, or 100 years ago, or even 1000 years ago? And in some ways, it's not different in that, you know, people have always lied and we've always had cognitive bias. But the thing that makes the ecosystem so virulent right now is that um, we've got the means to amplify lies like never before. And not only to amplify it to everyone, to micro target to exactly the people who we want to get that message. That is an extremely dangerous feature 
uh, on on social media. You know, it can it can help. Micro targeting is you know used for marketing things that they want us to buy, but sometimes the thing that they want us to buy is falsehood and hate, and so that's a, a dangerous thing. The other dangerous uh, piece of the ecosystem is it's simply that. Some people, uh, disinformers, have figured out the mechanism to get what they want is to radicalize other people into disbelief. So, I mean, again, this has been the case for, you know, maybe centuries. But now I think of denialism as strategic. I think of disinformation as the catalyst for uh, organized denial, where, you know, the, the disinformer, the creator of of disinformation has a special interest. They want something. They want money. They want political power. They want their ideology to be ascendant. And the way that they do that is by sharing their false information, creating, you know, tribalism around factual issues, and really creating victims. Uh, that's one of the most important things about our environment right now. A lot of people they don't realize that they're victimized by this. Um, I think to the pandemic, uh, a lot of people who died during the pandemic because they wouldn't take their uh, vaccines did so because they believed someone who was lying to them. And the person who was lying to them sometimes was lying for their own interest. They didn't, they didn't care uh, about the other person. And so that's a very toxic epistemological environment. I mean, that's an environment in which we all feel overwhelmed. We have to be our own fact checkers. We don't know who to trust. Um, and everything seems partisan. And, you know, so we're suspicious of one another. And that's a, that's a real danger. So that's, uh, I mean, that it's, um, it's a frightening picture, isn't it? And I promise not to be just too morbid in every, every answer I give tonight. But I, but I think that's the environment that we find ourselves in. Right. So let's let's actually dig in a little more into this victimization of believers. Um, there's a really compelling part of the book where you talk at length about this. Uh, right now, I'm doing a story about climate denial. And, you know, experts are telling me that, of course, there's a major society wide harm to climate denial. But of course, individual believers um, are also at great risk because they're they're likely to, for example, not move out of areas at risk for um, increasing floods or wildfires. So in your book, um, you have some pretty wild statistics on, on the believer front, right? That 32% believe the stolen election nonsense, that 23% of people think 9-11 was an inside job, that 25 people think that COVID was planned, which is just wild. Um, so you mentioned that uh, deniers aren't born, they were made, and that most denialism is actually about identity. And you talk mm -hmm. about how to address them, right? Pre-bunking, content rebuttals, calm and empathetic face-to-face -face conversations. Yes but also that the talk to them approach is not really scalable. So yeah. we'll talk about solutions a little bit later, but but what is it in the water these days that's making conspiracy theorists such an attractive identity? It's, it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a puzzle. Um, I, my, the way I started to think about this, my, my route for thinking about what I now call reality denial, the denial about the 2020 election, denial about uh, what January 6th really was, starts with science denial. Um, I look at the tobacco industry in the 1950s, which was hair on fire worried about this um, forthcoming study that was going to show a causal link between smoking and lung cancer. And so what did they do? They brought in a public relations expert who told them to fight the science. And they did successfully through public relations. They didn't try to show that smoking didn't cause cancer. They just raised doubt where they're wasn't any. Um, and they succeeded in their goal of selling cigarettes for the next 40 years. That really paved the way, I think. Uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway in, the, in their brilliant book, uh, Merchants of Doubt, call that the tobacco strategy. And that was the blueprint for, as you know, for climate denial, for acid rain, for the ozone hole, for you know all sorts of denial later. And I think that what happened is that you know, it's easy from a certain point of view to say, well, science denial is just absurd. Who are these people? Why would they believe that? We can just skip over it. I mean, it's ridiculous. What 
we don't realize is it was wildly successful. It actually radicalized a lot of people, which is, as you say, a, a, a way of, uh, of victimizing them. And so, you know, we end up in a situation where suppose you're a politician and you reality is not quite what you want it to be. You know, you wish reality were slightly different because you, it would increase your political power to pretend that crime was either going up or going down or that the economy was or wasn't expanding, you know, just whatever facts you wish weren't true. I think that politicians began to learn that they could take a page from science denial and run that exact same playbook on reality. And that's what makes it so dangerous because the that means that denialism is actually getting worse. And that's why my talk to them solution that I tried and tried and even wrote a book about called How to Talk to a Science Denier. I mean, I went to a flat earth convention and tried this out and wrote about it. And I'm convinced that the only way to convince someone to listen to you is to listen to them. And the only way that anyone ever changes their mind about this fact that some has somehow become a part of their identity for whatever reason is for them to trust you. And they only do that when you're calm and respectful and patient with them. But as you said, it's not enough. It's, it's simply not enough. It's not a scalable solution. We can never get the whole way there. And I was hoping, uh, you know, in that book that, that this was the, the special sauce that was going to help us get out of the infodemic. But it turns out that we don't need to just treat the sick. We need to keep them from getting sick. And in order to keep them from getting sick, we need to try to fight this information. And so I wanted to write the new book to say not that there was anything wrong with my argument in the in the earlier book, just that it was in you should still buy the book. It was incomplete. Um, and you know, we need to fight disinformation in several different ways. And we will get into those many, many different ways that you suggest in a little okay. bit. But let's let's continue on this this um this particular topic. You know, you talk in the book about how science deniers tend to follow the same flawed reasoning, right? That they cherry pick evidence, they believe in conspiracy theories, uh, they engage in illogical reasoning, they rely on fake experts and they denigrate yes. real ones and they have impossible expectations for the other side. And then you explain how that list also applies to proponents of Trump's big lie. Um, yes. So can you, can you focus specifically on that point about the experts, the strategy of not just taking out a fact, but also the fact tellers of, you know, not just raising doubt, but fomenting distrust. I mean, what, what are the consequences of a mentality of don't just lie, polarize your words? Uh, it creates team building around factual issues and team building is extremely useful. If what you want is power or money. I mean, if you can create if you can create aggrievement, you know, if you can create grievance around a factual issue, you've got them. I mean, the, the tobacco companies sort of did this around smoking. The um, fossil fuel companies sort of did this around climate change. I mean, climate change didn't used to be as polarized as it was. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember a public service ad where Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich were sitting on a couch saying, you know, we're going to whip global warming. Uh, and, you know, looking back on that, I mean, wow, what a moment in time. But it was in someone's interest to polarize it. And when th this is why in this information is so insidious, because it gets people to believe something false and it polarizes them around a factual issue. And it makes them distrustful of the other side and feel helpless to know the truth without turning to, you know, whoever the leader is who has, uh, you know, polarized them in the first place. And that's, by the way, why I think it's such a threat, not just to science, but democracy. Because once we're that polarized, for whatever reason, we're not talking to each other. And if we don't have an agreed upon set of facts, we're in, you know, we're in real trouble. Right. And we're seeing this kind of play out now, this intense polarization when we're watching, you know, the drumbeat of the Trump indictments and the Republican um, 
the first Republican primary debate last night. I, what are you seeing in the news that is surprising to you or that is underscoring everything you're writing in this book? Because right now in this moment, I feel like it's it's really encapsulating what you're talking about in the book. You know, I've had this conversation with my editor so many times. We think, oh, I wish the book were out now. You know, it's such a perfect time, but, you know, it's not going to come out for another six months. But then six months goes by and, you know, no, this seems like the perfect time because there's always something happening. What's been happening recently is, you know, just simply all the disinformation surrounding uh, the indictments. I mean, Trump is doubling down on this idea that what, that it was a perfect phone call, that he's being um, persecuted uh, because there, somebody is weaponizing the uh, Department of Justice. Um, it's the same thing over and over. And the, the really scary part is that the mechanism that he's using to do it are very simple, obvious disinformation techniques. Things that, you know, if you study disinformation, you you know these, the repetition effect, what aboutism, fire hose of falsehood. These are easy. I mean, these are these are ABC one, two, three techniques, but to people who are not used to them, they fall for it. And so he's still pulling the wool over people's eyes. The thing that's actually the most <clears throat> upsetting to me recently is that you've seen this sort of metastasize in Congress to the point where Jim Jordan is now running his weaponization of government committee to make the argument that disinformation, st the study of disinformation is censorship that you can't even fight back against disinformation. You just have to let everybody speak uh, because anything else you know, violates uh, free speech and the, the First Amendment, which just guarantees a polluted information environment. I mean, that's a disinformer's dream because if you think of Putin for a minute, what does he want? Why does he use something like the fire hose of falsehood? It's because if nobody knows what's true, there's no blame. He, he did it. Putin did it today when he was talking about Prigozhin's plane going down. He said, you know, well, maybe it was a mechanical failure. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was that. You know, he did. He did everything but take. He, maybe it was the Ukrainians who did it. You know, he, he just, you know, one after another, one lie after another, lies that contradicted one another. He said everything but I did it, even though we sort of know <laughs> that he did. So do you think globally we're leaning more toward the Jim Jordan playbook? I ask this because in my coverage of disinformation, I've increasingly found that it's it's such an interconnected information ecosystem out there, right? There are people in the U.S. who hear misinformation from relatives abroad um, over different channels, um, and, and it bounces back here, and then it bounces back there, and it's this unvirtuous cycle, so to speak. But then you have countries like Sweden or France or Taiwan that are, are running up their own uh, governmental agencies that are focused on fighting disinformation. So globally speaking, where where are we at? Where's the balance at at the moment it's, in this fight? It's such, it's such an interesting moment. I mean, Tim Snyder got my attention in 2016 when he wrote on tyranny because he saw this coming. He said, you know, look at Hungary you know, look what's happening in other countries that were previously democracies and they're going down this road and we're, we could go down that road as well. And uh, Tiffany, you just raised an extremely important issue uh, um, about, you know, what's happening in other countries. Well, some countries are deciding, yes, we should fight disinformation. But some of those countries that are deciding to fight disinformation are doing it disingenuously. They're doing it in bad faith because in fighting disinformation, they get to define disinformation and imprison their enemies. So you see this, the prime example here is Turkey. They passed a law in Turkey that, you know, you, you can't share false information. Well, so should they be applauded because they're fighting disinformation? No, because what they're actually doing is defining disinformation as political speech against the government and using that to imprison uh, a, a, a dissidents. You find the same thing in Russia, right? Russia passed this law uh, very soon after the uh, 
beginning of the Ukrainian war, uh, their attack on Ukraine. And um, a lot of independent journalists fled Russia. And uh, I'm not sure I blame them. I mean, the, there's many brave ones who stayed, but they're risking jail because now, what is it, 10 years in jail if you share disinformation in Russia? Um, so, you know, they can pretend that they're fighting disinformation, but they're not. And I have to say, uh, maybe unwisely, because I'm on camera and this will go public, I was approached by a foreign government uh, a few years back they who was interested in my book on post-truth and wanted to hear more about it. And I refused because I felt that what they wanted me to do was to teach them how to do it. They, they were... Um, one of these countries that later, you know, slid down that road. And I'm not going to say more about it than that. But it was it was a scary moment because everyone is watching everyone else and learning from them. And sometimes what they're learning is, you know, how how to how to fight this war in, in bad faith. Yeah, I was just reading about how the Marcos administration in the Philippines, um, which was elected in an election that was overrun with dis disinformation, is now starting its own disinformation office, which, yes. you know, raises many questions because this is this is obviously <laughs> the government that has tried to suppress um, Maria Risa of, of uh, Rappler and, and innumerable other activists who are fighting for truth. But uh, thank you for your answer to that. Um, let, let's move on. You talked about this a little earlier. Um, how the post-truth playbook involves demoralizing people with a tsunami of falsehoods, um, so much so that they begin to give up on the idea that truth can be known at all. Um, this concept is something that's being cited a lot these days um, as a reason to be worried about artificial intelligence, uh, that it leads to something called the liar's dividend, uh, which allows people to say, oh, that image of me dealing cocaine is AI generated. That's not really me, even yeah. though it is. Uh, just today, uh, there were a slew of AI Trump mugshots, you know, with the exception of the yes. one showing an orange with a lemon peel for our hair. <laughs> a lot of those are pretty realistic. So, yeah. so tell me a little bit about what happens when truth dies because it simply can't be recognized. It, it's it's so it, it's such a complicated thing, isn't it? Because when you live in a world in which there are deep fakes and you live in a world in which there's a uh, weaponized AI, which is coming. Um, you live in a world in which people will not only think that a true thing is false. They'll think, I'm sorry, the false thing is true. They'll think that a true thing is false. How close are we to the era in which videotaped evidence is no longer reliable in court. I was just reading the other day something of uh, in a uh, publication by uh, for trial lawyers who were talking about jurors now not necessarily believing videotaped evidence and fearing the day when they could no longer use audio or video evidence in court to, to make a compelling case. Because if it's that easy to generate fake images, then what's to stop people from saying, oh, well, that that's just fake. And see, that too can be in bad faith. I mean, some people would just be confused and you know, they don't, they don't know. But it also allows disinformers to say, you know, that video where they caught me, uh, that was fake. And if you know you've got enough people on your team who want to believe that or who will say they believe it, even if they don't then that sort of carries the day. That's what I'm the most afraid of with chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera, is that disinformation will get easier and easier to produce. And it will so overwhelm the system that it will crowd out true information. Uh, it's not, as I said, it's not just that people will uh, think that if something false is true. They will sort of give up on the idea of truth as if it's impossible to tell. I mean, you already hear, I already hear people say, I just get so tired of the news. I'm tired of being my own fact checker. I don't know who to trust anymore. You can't trust this person. You can't trust that person. So I, I just, I don't even follow the news anymore. That's, you know, that reminds me of the quotation um, from Hannah Arendt that I put in the book where she says, um, 
the uh, well, I've I've got it right here. I'm going to butcher it if I don't uh, actually uh, read it, and I know exactly where it is. She says the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exists. Those are the people who are easiest to rule, the people who have given up, not necessarily the true believers, the people who say, yeah, whatever you want. Right. So I was talking to um, a researcher a while ago who described this as information nihilism. Um, this person was saying, you know, we have to be very careful about disinformation, education, media literacy, that sort of thing. You know, you want to give people hope and Yes. Not let them think that it's it's an uphill, unwinnable battle. Um, That's so, right. <laughs> this is why we're having conversations like this. Uh, so in your book, you give us the timeline, right? Modern disinformation warfare starts in Russia in the 1920s. Uh, modern science denial with the tobacco industry uh, plotting in 1953 to deny the link between cigarettes and lung cancer, which you addressed earlier. Uh, Trump applying Russian-inspired... Uh, disinformation tactics like the fire hose of lies he used politics so here's the big question um what do we do do we restore the fairness doctrine do we revise section 230 do we crack mm -hmm. down on the known bad actors do we yeah i love this part uh do we lean on the so-called layer cake of web hosts yes. and content delivery networks financial service providers we wait for kids to learn better critical thinking i mean how do we fix as you put it the polluted information stream my answer to that is yes all of those things we need to do all of those things we need to um we need better critical edu uh, critical thinking, better education for kids, but we can't wait for the kids to save us. Yes, it would be nice if Congress did more, uh, you know, legislation. What if Congress understood that they don't have to be the fact checker in chief, but merely to mandate that the social media companies have more transparency over their algorithms? What if they had to appoint a board of people to, you know, to look at their algorithms and head off trouble in advance rather than waiting for a whistleblower to come along. What if the social media companies themselves, you know, it could institute something like that even without legislation. So, I mean, there are a lot of different things that we can do. Um, one is that we can begin to, we can actually armor up ourselves. There's been some uh, really brilliant work recently on uh, the concept of pre-bunking. Um, Sander Vanderlinen, uh, has a book called Foolproof, in which he is, and he's a cognitive scientist, in which he's arguing in favor of the this idea of inoculation theory. And uh, my friend Andy Norman, who's uh, on today, wrote a book called Mental Immunity, in which he's trying to, uh, you know, help us to uh, foment this uh, this revolution. So that's part of it. But the other part of it, I think, is. Uh, grassroots. Uh, I mean, gra and grassroots means that we're not helpless. We have more power over the internet companies. We have more power over cable TV than we think. What if we didn't just write a letter to complain? What if we wrote to their advertisers? What if we didn't just write to Twitter or Facebook, but we wrote to Akamai? We wrote to PayPal. We wrote to all that layer cake uh, of all those companies that I listed in the book that they depend on. Uh, it, it's really, you know, it does, you, it, anybody who's worked in media understands that it takes about three people to write a letter before the editor comes over and says, what about this? I mean, how many, how many hundred people would have to write to CNN or MSNBC or even Fox News to get them to change their coverage. It really wouldn't take that much, especially if they started to get the advertisers in on it. So, you know, at the end of my book, I outline 10 steps that we can take that ordinary citizens can take to fight back against disinformation. The most important step is that we have to understand that we're in an information war. The, the biggest mistake that the media makes, in my opinion, is to report on this issue as misinformation. Misinformation is an accident or a mistake. And if you think that, you know, th the problem that we're facing is misinformation, then maybe you report on it like a hurricane. You know, hurricane coverage 
scares the hell out of you, put your head down, but there's nothing you can do because it's a natural disaster. But if it's disinformation, then it's a lie. And if it's a lie, then there's a liar, which means we're actually can do something. We're in a, we need to get on a war footing. And so I think that we, I wrote this book primarily to wake people up to the idea that we're already in an information war. We, we may not realize it, but Russia realizes it. I mean, we're getting disinformation from foreign and domestic sources. One of the scariest books I read recently is the Handbook of Russian Information Warfare, which is a NATO training manual for their commanders and soldiers to, to wake them up to the fact that Russia already considers itself to be at war, not a kinetic war, but an information war, which is part of war for them against the West. Um, they were behind the falsehood about there being um, microchips in our vaccines. How many thousand people died from that? They were behind an awful lot of interference in the 2016 election. Now, of course, there's disinformation coming out of the Trump uh, campaign that, oh, that was all a hoax. I was exonerated. No, second volume of the Mueller report shows they they were there was a lot of interference and they didn't have the evidence to um, charge him. Well, we actually we don't know because we haven't seen the unredacted version with conspiracy. But did Russia interfere? Yes. Did the Trump campaign welcome that interference? Yes, they did. So, you know, we we are really getting it from all sides. And here's the problem. We're just citizens. We're not equipped to, to fight a war. How can they ask this of us? It's because no one else is coming to save us. The government, the military, our military is actually pretty good at fighting disinformation, but they can't fight it against domestic sources. It's not allowed under the Constitution, which is why foreign disinformation is so often laundered through domestic sources. It's why you see a story come out of RT later in the day. It appears on Fox News and then is broadcast back to you know Russia that evening. Um, is that coordinated? I don't know, but it's awfully worrisome. When you see something like that, at least the Russians understand that in order to get disinformation in front of the American public, they need to launder it because then, you know, it's it's in the wild. It's like it, it's an infodemic at that point. So, Sorry, so effectively about this. No, that's that's great, um, because it sounds like from what you're saying, we've effectively been drafted into a war that most of us don't know we're fighting, um, which which brings me to you. I want to know a little bit about, you know, how you got into this field. You know, you talk about in the book being a little boy who loved encyclopedias. Um, mm -hmm. Give us a sense of your personal journey. You know, have you come across this yeah. information in your personal life? What's your MO when uh, unfounded rumors come up at the Thanksgiving table? Tell us about, about your role in all of this and how you got here. Uh as a little boy, I just did not understand how anybody ever fought against science and reason. You know, I, well, I came from a working class family. I didn't go to a very good school, but we had an encyclopedia. And my dad said, everything's in the encyclopedia. So I read the encyclopedia and I loved the articles on the scientists and the philosophers and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And I was just scandalized by the idea that anybody was against the idea that you should wash your hands before surgery, you know, or something like this. I mean, who are these idiots? And I found myself thinking, you know, oh, I was born too late. I mean, how easy would it be on this to be on the side of truth and reason if I'd just been born 500 years earlier? But I went into philosophy because I admired philosophers and I enjoyed that type of reasoning. And I gravitated toward a uh, philosophy of science and people. And I really started out wanting to advocate for a science of human behavior, which is an unpopular view, but then people started to attack natural science. And I thought, well, we can't have this. And so I wanted to defend science. And then they started to attack truth and reality. And I thought, oh man, this problem is worse. So my personal journey was just getting sucked in. I mean, I, I care about all of these things that I'm writing about and public philosophy. I was doing public philosophy before it was called public philosophy because I was feeling like um, truth and knowledge and reason are very important. And then all of a sudden these were in the news and where were the philosophers? They weren't anywhere. And so I thought I need to do this. I need to be involved in this because I mean, 
if a philosopher can't stand up for truth and reason, who can and who else is doing it? And so I started to write a series of books, starting with Post-Truth. I wrote one called The Scientific Attitude, How to Talk to a Science Denier, and then now on Disinformation, which are trade books. They're supposed to, you know, they're aimed at a general audience. They're easier to read than an academic book. Uh, and they're intended to, you know, kind of engage with this, what I think is the crisis of our time, which is an epistemic crisis. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, that's a philosophy word, epistemic, uh, problem of, of knowledge. How do we know what we know? I mean, it excites me at some level that people are even talking about this. I mean, the nerd philosopher in me loves the fact that, you know, in polite conversation, they're actually talking about justification and warrant and evidence. And I think, oh, goody, you know, I know about this stuff. This is fun. But it's also, I feel useful because this is what I've believed in since I was a little boy. And I want to fight for this now. And I and I know now what I didn't know then, which is that I was not born into the era in which all truth was discovered and these wars were over. I was born into the era in which all of a sudden people were fighting back against the equivalent of washing your hands before surgery. And that, you know, truth always needs an advocate. And I wanted to be that advocate along with so many others who are, you know, doing this kind of work. I wanted to be one of them. Do you think we're always going to be in an information war? Is this the sort of thing that ebbs and flows or is kind of a constant that we're just trying to keep from getting worse? It ebbs and flows. One of the greatest pieces of wisdom I ever learned was from my mom. She said the pendulum swings. Well, that's good news if you think the pendulum swing in a good direction, but it also means that it swings back, right? And I mean, how does it happen that we live in this era? I I, I still marvel at it. I, I was in Rome recently, sitting at the foot of the statue of Giordano, Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake for his belief in 1600, for his belief that there were other worlds, that the the stars were other suns and they could have other planets. And, you know, you hear these stories about, you know, what happened to Bruno, what happened to Socrates, what happened to Galileo, and your jaw sort of drops and you think, well, that could never happen again. And I still wonder, why does that happen? I mean, nobody has been burned at the stake recently, but if you look at dictatorships around the world and you look at the democracies that are drifting uh, into autocracy i don't know how far this is going to go that's that concerns me i mean will dissidents be jailed in the united states i don't think that's inconceivable anymore six years ago um you know uh uh, uh Tim Snyder was writing on tyranny, and my friend Jason Stanley was writing a book called How Propaganda Works, and then he wrote one called How Fascism Works. And people were laughing over this. Oh, you, you know, you're overreacting. I don't think they're laughing anymore. I mean, Trump has announced what his second term agenda would be. He wants to gut the civil service. He wants to change the libel laws. These are all scary things with great precedent in history of going down the wrong road. I mean, they are they are literally burning books. Uh, they're banning books, but they're also burning books in some places. I did not think I would ever live in such an era, but here I am. So to wrap up, tell us a little bit about the reporting of the book. You know, you've been thinking about this topic, obviously, for your entire life. Uh, when you were reporting this book in particular, were people resistant to talk to you? Was most of your research conducted online? You know, did you talk to conspiracy theorists, climate denialists, stop the steel proponents? I mean, how, how does one write a book about information and make sure that all the information in it is backed up and ironclad? Tell us about the process. Well, it, it helped. I'm a scholar and I'm used to evidence and footnotes. And I'm very, very lucky to be published by MIT Press, which is not only a respectable academic press, but they have a trade division. And so they're not scared of footnotes. One of my books for them had 30 pages of footnotes and they weren't scared by this. And I, and that's a good thing because one thing you, when you get challenged, I get challenged all the time 
from science seminars that say, what are your sources? And I can say, well, it's in the book. You know, you, you can read that. And so, I mean, my process is always to fact check, you know, to make sure that I get things right, to interview people. I interviewed counterintelligence officials. I interviewed uh, U.S. Army people. I talked to deniers. I mean, I, I talked really to everyone that I could. And I have to say, I'm a bit of an idiot because I came to this late. I thought I had it figured out with the last book, and I didn't because two things happened since I wrote the last book. Science denial morphed into reality denial following the exact same playbook of using disinformation. That got my attention. And so that when I really realized the crucial role of disinformation in causing not just science denial, but reality denial, I thought I have to write a new book. And the second epiphany that came to me was, we can't just talk to the victims. We've got to try to stop people from becoming victims. It's, you know, again, creators to amplifiers to believers. The place to pinch is amplifiers. You can't get the creators to stop doing it because it's in their best interest. The believers are victims. You can't get them to give up their beliefs. But you can you can crack down on the amplifiers. And I spend quite a bit of the book talking about that with apologies because I say some pretty harsh things about the media in the book, but it's because I think that the media are so important and maybe the tip of the spear, the people who can save us. And so I, I want them to be perfect. You know, I want them to be just as energized as I am. If I could change one thing on cable TV, it's that every single time I hear them say misinformation in my head, I say disinformation. You know, it, it, is it is that disinformation? Um, some some of them get it right, but most of them get it wrong. And I think that that misleads the public. The public needs to know, you know, how many people know that that uh, story about there being microchips in the vaccines was a Russian disinformation campaign. Most people don't know that. Um, how many people died because of it who never knew who came up with that story? But I mean, that was, you know, appalling. And there are all sorts of things like this. The Russians have been denialists about American science for 20 years. There's a wonderful art article in your newspaper, the New York Times from 2019 called Putin's Long War Against American Science, which really lays out perfectly how Putin has attacked American science to try to undermine us. And it's not a big step to learn from there how he's doing it against American democracy. So let's um, wrap up with a uh, what I thought was a particularly powerful quote from the book, which is, the truth does not die when liars take power, it dies when truth tellers stop defending it. Um, so I, I hope everyone buys this book and, and takes away the lessons that you've discussed here today. And I think uh, it's now time for us to move to questions. Thank you Thank so much, you. Lee, for, for chatting with me. Tiffany, th what, a, what a terrific uh, set of questions. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the Q&A open. Um, and so um, if you have questions, feel free to type in the chat, uh, which um, as they come up. So um, uh, uh, Tiffany, there's um, uh, there's a question from uh, Deanna um, about isn't there isn't there use for the term uh, uh, misinformation in the sense of spotlighting the innocent sharing of falsehoods, though, uh, by contrast to the intentional work of disinformers, um, we'd love to hear more on that. Yeah, that that's a that's a terrific question, and the philosopher in me loves that question too because you know the, make a make a distinction here. When somebody believes a falsehood, it's uh, and they you know they're not they don't know that it's false they you know they think that it's true technically speaking that's misinformation so that's that's correct here's the problem though if somebody if something starts with disinformation that is it's an intentional falsehood and then another person say is you know witlessly hearing it and then passing it on do you then change and start to call it misinformation? I don't. I still call it disinformation because its source was a lie. You know, I think of misinformation as the fairly innocuous uh, stuff where 
you know, you you hear things or you think of things that sort of make sense, but they, you know, they really don't pan out. And we've all had these sorts of things happen to us. And by the way, when we're not radicalized around this, then evidence can convince us, you know, oh, I always thought that X and then somebody provides you evidence. No, you change your mind because it's just misinformation. You're glad to be corrected and you move on. Disinformation um, starts as a lie and it's you've heard you've all heard the phrase it's not a nice phrase useful idiot right you you it it goes to people that they then count on to spread uh, that disinformation i still use the term disinformation because i never want to have people lose sight of where it came from so you know when when nikki minaj uh started to talk about you know the danger with the covid vaccines to you know the uh testicles and you know all these different things I think she was sharing that because she was genuinely worried. I think that for her, I think that was misinformation. But where did that start? That was disinformation. Um, and so I, I still want to call that disinformation with no disrespect to her. She was victimized by this. Uh, just to make a finer point on it. Nobody wakes up one day and wonders whether, you know, a Jewish space laser caused the California wildfires. That's disinformation. Somebody thought that up and shared it as a lie. That's not misinformation. So when that gets shared, that's disinformation, not misinformation, I think. But I love that question. Yeah, the intentionality, I think, is really important in this. Let's see. There's um, another question. Uh, yeah, we have another question um, on, can you elaborate on the concept of pre-bunking and how people can inoculate themselves against disinformation? Yeah, pre-bunking, it's interesting. There was a study in Nature Human Behavior in 2019, which showed that you can convince people to overcome their false beliefs. And there were a couple of different ways to do it. Um, and these were debunking. You know, the, and but I mean, that's good news, isn't it? That if somebody hears false information, there were, you know, two ways to do it. One was content rebuttal and one was technique rebuttal. And, you know, this was possible. But then there was a commentary on that study from Sandra Vanderlinden, who I mentioned earlier, to talk about pre-bunking. Pre-bunking is when you get there first. I mean, debunking is when somebody hears false information and then you tell them why it was false. And it's sometimes hard to get them to give that up. Um, with Mark Twain, who said, uh, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they've been fooled. I mean, once somebody hears false information, they want to believe it. They don't want to give it up, even if they just heard it five minutes ago. But what pre-bunking allows you to do is to get in there first and say, you know, you're going to hear a message that's going to have a conspiracy theory in it. Be very careful. Here's what the person is going to say. And then the person hears it. And they go, oh, yeah, they, that's kind of what that person warned me against. So, and I mean, this has been shown empirically to be superior to, de to debunking. Um, President Biden used it at the beginning of the uh, Ukraine uh, uh, conflict when Russia was looking for a pretext to attack Ukraine. They were trying to manufacture an atrocity. They had a film crew and, you know, these people, the, the actors who were going to go out and, um, you know, Russian actors who were going to pretend to be Ukrainians. And Biden exposed it. He got, you know, he declassified whatever intelligence we had and said, you know what they're going to do? Here's what they're going to do. Completely defanged it. I mean, they found another pretext to invade. They always do. But that's how you fight disinformation. You fight disinformation by getting there ahead of them. Um, you know, the, the repetition effect works, but also there's something called the primacy effect. People believe what they hear first. And if what they hear first is disinformation, you're in trouble. But if what they hear first is your warning that they might hear disinformation, much better. So I'm a I'm a great advocate of pre-bunking. And by the way, full disclosure, I'm on the uh, I'm on the board of uh, of the uh, CERCI, the organization that uh, Andy runs, the Cognitive Immunology Research Collaborative. So we're we're working on this problem on some practical solutions. 
Nice. There's a uh, there's a bulletin that this group called the Climate Action Against Disinformation put out recently during this horrible summer of wildfires, where they explicitly say, try to pre-bunk these rumors, yes. these conspiracy yes. theories about wildfires before you're in the middle of a wildfire, because That's trying right. to tell someone that no, a space laser is not what caused this horrible tragedy in the middle of a of the heat is is not going to be as effective as saying it's a really hot summer we might get some wildfires you might hear these things they're not true uh so next question yeah uh we have a, another question um ai will most likely generate more disinformation and accelerate the need for fact checking but can but can humans come out ahead of it in time hope so I w when I was in Rome, sitting at the foot of Giordano Bruno, contemplating the future, I went back to my room that night, just before I was about to give a paper called Disinformation, a Problem from Hell. And there on CNN was Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, who quit his job at Google so that he could say that AI was an extinction level threat to humanity. Now, that'll get your attention. I mean, it's already hard enough to sleep with jet lag and nerves over my paper the next day. He comes on and says, AI is an extinction level threat to humanity. Wow, really hard to sleep after that. I think I got up and took a little walk. Um, I do not think that we should close down AI. Uh, but I do think that we need to be careful of how we use it. I mean, we haven't already we haven't even figured out social media yet and now ai is you know coming at a million miles an hour the problem with ai right now i mean the first thing i did because i'm perverse the first thing i did when chat gpt got popular is i tried to get it to produce disinformation you know i would say you know is it true that there are microchips in the vaccines and i mean i was that trying to make smoke come out of the thing to get it to produce disinformation and it wouldn't and I, part of me applauded that. And I thought, great, somebody, you know, who's programming this cares. But then I thought, yeah, but that means it can be diddled with. And if it can be diddled with, it can be diddled with by disinformers as well, which is a very dangerous thing. So I think that AI is, a, I don't know if it's an extinction level threat. I think it is a great threat to uh, the manufactured disinformation because you won't need troll farms, you'll need troll gardens. If you look at the overseas threat uh, of foreign disinformation, one of the rate limiting steps has been that they don't have people who speak fluent English. First thing they do in the troll farms is give them a test to see how good their English is before they put them on you know, Twitter or comments on the Washington Post. Um, they won't need that anymore. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a danger. Now, can AI maybe help? In, in that fight, maybe it can, but uh, it is, this is going to be a very difficult problem. And as I said, every time I write a book, the problem gets worse and worse. And here we are. I mean, I don't mention AI in my book because the book was already in, in uh, galleys before this came out. And, you know, here we are, but it is, it is certainly a scary moment because you can just trace out how AI exacerbates the disinformation problem and uh hopeful sign uh i don't remember his name but one of the uh the the founder of open ai the company that made chat gpt yeah he he came out and said please regulate us you know please we want to work with the government and you know they didn't get it perfect but they came up with some uh it, some cooperative ways to get ahead of this. And I, I think that's good. Yeah, thanks for the assist there, Tiffany. I knew that you'd know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really mind boggling that AI has advanced as much as it has in the eight months since this year started. Um, yeah. If I can actually toot my own horn, we just yes. wrote a story about efforts to catch AI um, producing misinformation and, and lies and et cetera. Um, a group of I think more than 2,000 hackers just converged at the DEF CON um, cybersecurity conference a few weeks ago in Las Vegas. And with the blessing of the Biden administration and companies like OpenAI and Google, uh, they tried to hack all of these systems. And 
got it to do pretty scary things. But the hope is that their findings are going to be used by the companies to, yeah. you know, create some parameters and make the tools a little safer to use. And and how and what's the policy on that too? Because even if we know how to do it, if we can't implement it, I mean, Biden had a disinformation governance board for two weeks before it got disbanded. Mm-hmm. And it was taken down by a disinformation campaign. I mean, it's just, it's tragic. So, I mean, some of the problem is policy. Right, right. And then poor Nina Jankowicz, who was running that board uh, in in yes. an awful full circle, has has since been the target of the fakes. Uh, and and called uh, before Jim Jordan's disinform uh, his uh, weaponization of government committee, as was Kate Starbird and uh, mm-hmm. other folks that they're trying to chill the fight against disinformation. It is uh, it, it is a tragedy. Thanks for writing the book, Lee. Well, thank, thank you. you, thank you for the work that you do, Tiffany, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. I hope you will have us back. 